and we had weak wage numbers. Of course, you know, the, some companies have paid some bonuses, but if you take a look at base pay, it is still foreign. Why? And in particular, services are paying less, less I think, the wages. I talked to young guys, and for example, you know, um, I, I actually had a, you know, the experience or the occasion to talk to a university students. Do you do any uh, advice, which is, I think, the part-time jobs? They say, oh, yeah, I'm doing, and you know, which company are you working for? Convenience to us. Okay, what happened to your, uh, I think, unit wage, hourly wage? And he said, it, it used to be 1,000, and today 1,050. Okay, up by like, you know, 0.5%. So it's a good thing. Sorry, it, it, it's like 5% already. But the point is, the, it, is, it is really interesting, but I think those part-timers are now better paid at the very marginal, you know, the uh, situation, I mean, in, in the marginal part of the labor market. But medical industry, literature in general, and services are paying less and less. And this is probably because of the remaining weak profitability. So again, back to the Kanos and the chart of the, you know, the uh, cash flow of the companies and labor expenditure. But uh, but a point is that the uh, the reaction of the companies' profits to uh, weak currency, growth strategy, could be very much uneven. So small services industry may not necessarily uh, able be able to improve their profitability under weaker currency, for example. So what I'm talking about is money printing can work because money printing, weaker currency, higher stock prices could be stimulating consumption. Or growth strategy may work, uh, deregulation, <laughs> bit of you know, the higher productivity on the high end uh, of, of, of the Japanese economy. But in the meantime, we are very skeptical about the small businesses profit, profitability you know, improving going forward. And also, we have to think about the situation where our fiscal situation is really bad. And if I take a look at medical expenditure, it has been kind of uh, constrained. They cannot easily increase medical expenditure. So the caretaker's wages cannot go up easily. So those things are very structural. So we have to think about that. And something really strange going on because labor market conditions are not reflected in wage increases. Something structural uh, downside impact of wages are going on. So that's why we, we tend to think that one shot increase in VAT from five to eight could damage consumption, in particular by lower income uh, households, and that should lead into a um, um, direction of job markets, cannot be offset by government initiative on, on growth strategy and other things. And then consumption goes down, wage decline could intensify, and if the expected inflation rate goes down, further dampening effect on consumption. So uh, it might be safer for the government to stick to a, not stick to, um, to change the VAT hike um, you know, schedule from one-off three percentage point hike to 1% every year to see what is really happening uh, on, on the consumption. And the relating to that, the last slide is, is more as I think the, what we are a bit worried about is the um, possible increase in inequality in households uh, in, in terms of the uh, savings and wealth. The wealth distribution would be uh, continuously distorted by VAT hike. Uh, it's not necessarily only VAT high, but I think the, if the government targets on the lower income consumers, um, I think the point is that uh, their savings, you know, the capability would continue to weaken. And uh, the gap between the, um, uh, the higher income, lower income households, the savings over a medium run would continue to widen. So the VAT is more or less the uh, really, you know, uh, regressive uh, tax policy. So the impact on the savings, which is the savings is of course, you know, the uh, summation or accumulation of the, you know, uh, uh, income, 
more or less. So in that sense, I think that we have to be careful. Um, but again, you know, the, that means it might be the case for VAT tax hike to make lower income people to be more seriously working. Or that might lead to some, I think, the interesting labor reform. But in the meantime, if you do not think Japanese lower income people cannot easily get out of the lower income category, their savings activity, their savings capacity should be damaged quite meaningfully. So um, a bit of the social, not unless, but a bit instability could happen. Or it might be the case that this consumption tax hike leads to a even lower marriage rate birth rate kind of things, because in the young guys, uh, usually, of course, you know, because of the life cycle, uh, less, you know, less paid. So uh, this kind of thing would be your kind of the headwinds to uh, uh, consumption tax uh, in, in our view. But uh, the, uh, interestingly, I was picked up by the, that 660 experts kind of meeting, and uh, I was told that uh, we need somebody who is opposed to the idea. Because if everybody is, is supportive, it wouldn't work. So why don't you join? Because we need you as an opponent. And I said, fine, so I'm going to join. But I think the, uh, <laughs> the, the point is, you know, not you know, main, many number of the um, opponents to the VAT hike story uh, from the perspective of the fiscal consolidation. I totally agree with Kanos about the fiscal situation. And I think we need a uh, much faster, you know, the economic growth and uh, I think the reforms of things. But um, I'm probably less optimistic about the other policies of the government. Uh, and we are less, you know, less optimistic about the uh, trend growth of GDP of Japan. Um, so that's why we, we, we are more focused on uh, focusing on the dynamics of wages, uh, inflation, deflation, and sort of things. That's why we you know, coach us on the VA type. Thank you, Mr. Shirakawa. Thank you for your doubts. So let's start the Q&A section. Uh, if, if I may start for, with, with a question. So far, we spoke as it was just a domestic issue. But uh, I noticed that from time to time, this issue of consumption hike was sold to the Japanese public as also as an international issue. Say we, we have an obligation, Japan has an obligation to show to the international community how serious uh, he is in uh, in uh, toward fiscal consolidation, and uh, if uh, we do not, we don't do that. Uh, probably the rating, international rating agencies will downgrade our debt and so on. So I will ask to both of you: How strong is the international factor in this uh, decision of uh, the Japanese government to raise the consumption tax? Thanks. Yes, please. Right. Um, the, well, um, the, the Japan's experience is very, very important from an international perspective because all the developed economies are facing a basic problem. That is a lack of the growth. Actually, the, uh, because of the rapid growth of the market and in the, in a, the, um, the uh, emerging market, actually jobs are mostly generated in emerging e economies at the cost of uh, the developed economies. And the, well, think of, for example, the uh, role of the Thailand. Well, Thailand is just one of the that typical the emerging economies and where the many Japanese companies are um, the increasing the productions. Their uh, annual income is only a third, uh, the 3,000 something, 3.3 3 or 4,000 US dollars last year, just the 10% of Japan's. And actually, these days, um, the gold medalists of the Technology Olympic are the Thai or the other, those are the, the workers in um, the ASEAN countries, not Korea, those guys. Actually, why can't we compete with them? So it is natural to see a continued trend of the production, uh, the shift, shift of the production from Japan to the, those countries. So that is actually the US is basically facing the same problems. And, and th think, of, for example, the case of the Apple. They employ only 55,000 people in total in the U.S., but generate the more than a million jobs outside the U.S. So the well, U.S. job situation should improve, but only very slowly. So the Fed will remain very frustrated about that. 
So the, in Japan is the same, but Japan has also another problem that is a fiscal deficit. So the U.S. may face the same pro as the problem in 10 years and 20 years, as a, if to the extent Obamacare remains unchanged and still going on, then actually the U.S. will suffer from an increase in spending on those medical service care, medical cares. And Japan the same. Japan is far advanced in the, than the U.S. and other economies. So in this case, actually, what's, what's going on, what, on in Japan is quite Right. Uh, the, the experimental, and but the goal is very challenging, and uh, the so in that sense it is very important. But I don't think it could be an international problem in any time so soon. Even if the rating agencies downgrade the JGBs, who cares? When from the Japanese viewpoint, still the JGB ill has the best quality, and more importantly, uh, as I said to you, until inflation rate reaches two percent. The BOJ can purchase any amount of the JGBs, so there'll be no sell-off of the JGBs in the in the near future. I know many uh, the global trade bond traders. Actually, the many of them um, they feel uh, have, uh, have felt uh, very inclined to short JGB position, but all of them uh, the, their fingers were burnt, and so the, I heard somebody said saying to me in the past that. Uh, that if one has not, if the NRA bond trader has not shortened the JGP position, he's not a matured uh, the, the bond trader. So in other words, actually no one tried to challenge the BOJ at the moment. So therefore, it's not a global issue, but a domestic issues. But, so th this situation will last until um, the 2% inflation is achieved. All of a sudden, and also in a year, at the moment where well, we are enjoying the weekend situations, that could totally change the situation of the balance of payment. So until the, the, at the end of the last year, the Japan's balance of payment had a clear declining trend. So if we didn't have any, we have, didn't have a weak yen, probably the, we would have um, the large uh, the fiscal, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the current account deficit. In other words, uh, the domestic spending uh, would have exceeded the uh, savings. And under those circumstances, we have to rely on foreigners. But fortunately, we, are not, we haven't reached there. But in my view, that the weak end could end well, at some time in the future, because this is cyclical. And uh, so the, we are likely to see the declining trend of the, or worsening trend of the current account balances. So the, it, it's just a matter of time that the Japan's current account balance will fall into deficit again. That is a time, actually, we, we have to rely on foreigners' uh, the savings to fund the domestic, uh, the, um, the, uh, the fiscal, uh, the deficit. So the, the, at the moment, in my view, this is a purely a domestic issue, but in the future, it will be a quite the global issues. So the, and the global, uh, the, peop, uh, the, the people in the outside Japan should watch carefully the Japan's experiment. Okay. Mr. Shirakawa, you had uh, some uh, guy Yatsu in explaining a fa uh, is a factor in this issue or not? Uh, yeah, I think the myself and uh, Kano-san uh, actually have been, uh, you know, the projecting the Japanese external balance to become in deficit on structural basis as soon as 14, 15, right? So um, the think about I think the situation where Japan is running a um, deficit not only on the trade balance, but on the current account balance, and Japan becoming a, um, a net borrower country. Um, that is good for the global growth, theoretically speaking, but in the meantime, global economy would lose Japan as a capital exporter. Is that the problem or not? And if you think there's a problem, um, tightening fiscal is, doesn't make sense. It, it, in my view, and from the country's perspective, it is okay. Also, the, the, I think one big issue is if Japan has to borrow money from outside, interest rates should, should start to go up in theory, even though Kano-san said, yes, I think the BOJ can continue to buy JGBs. But in the meantime, the risk would be somewhat bigger if Japan becomes a net borrower country. So if you're a Ministry of Finance official, what you're going to you know, say would be, we don't want Japan is getting into a structural deficit situation, you have only two options. One is to expand exports. The other one is to what? Reduce imports. By what? Dampening consumption. It's really easy 
not necessarily easy, but I think if you do dampen consumption, punching consumers by raising VAT, you can make your trade balance improving. What is happening in Europe? Right now, the Europe is running the current account surplus. It's really not, I would say, ridiculous, but Europe is now a drug of the global economy. This you know, area is not buying things. They're just you know, reducing buying things and improving their own balance. But in the meantime, their contribution to the real GDP of the global is kind of zero. So in, in, in our understanding, um, the dampening consumption is, rational, you know, is somewhat rational because Japan may be suffering the shortage of savings, net borrowing countries risk, and higher interest rates. That is from the country's perspectives, you know, consumption tax is really, uh, you know, it, it can be really justified. I don't know if Gaiat is there, but I think what is happening to the global economy if, the, if Japan is, is running a deficit on a sustained basis, becoming borrower, one risk is the interest rate in the globe may pick up. Not necessarily meaningfully, but I th there is the possibility that if Japan becomes a net borrower country, uh, interest may pick, pick up. But uh, my argument is, Europe is now net lender. They are not net, net borrower. U.S. is still, still net borrower. China is net lender. Europe is net lender. And if Japan remains net lender, who is leading the economy? U.S.? I don't think so. Because U.S. sustainability, I don't think it's really high. So everybody wants to save money. Everybody wants to you know, they clean up their balance sheet. And, and is it really the case for, for the global economy? In my understanding, no. Maybe the deflation would be kicking in, uh, unfortunately. That'd be fine if you're, if you're I think, the, to see a very stable economy, but not inflation. Um, so I don't know the guidance uh, on, on Japan, but I think the Japan has made a very strong commitment to the international community that they will do fiscal consolidation. So uh, anyway, that, in that sense, uh, fiscal consolidation is an international commitment thing. Okay. Questions? Anthony? <clears throat> Anthony Rowley, <coughs> Singapore Business Times. I think this point about 1997 is interesting. Um, I think it was Hashimoto at that time who raised the consumption tax. Consumption fell, that the Prime Minister also fell. So everyone blamed the consumption tax, which, but of course in that year, as you pointed out, I think there was the Asian financial crisis, there was bank failures and so on. But I mean, has any survey been made of A, what actually influenced consumption among consumers, survey among consumers at that time? And I've seen lots of economic theorists, but again about um, any survey now of what, how people would react if the consumption tax is raised. Uh, are consumers saying, well, I shall stop buying at that point, or, or are they not? I mean, that seems to me to be a rather sort of missing link. And the other thing is, if I can quickly ask you about if um, corporate taxes are cut, um, there's no guarantee that uh, companies will pay more, for example. But is there any way of linking a cut in the corporate tax to uh, a wage rise or indeed a, uh, a rise in, cap in capex to among companies? <coughs> Um, uh, I think uh, I, I understand your, the, uh, the second point. Is the first point is a comment or a question? And, uh, it, it, 99 seven situation or just more in general the response of the consumers to the attack on something? Whether any survey was made after 1997, why did you stop consuming so much? Was it because you were consumption taxes? Oh, I see, okay. Right, okay. In case of um, the, both Shiraka san and I were at the BOJ at the time, and uh, I clearly remembered that towards the uh, end of the summer in 1997, uh, the drag from the consumption tax rate hike on, among the consumers was just ending. But uh, unfortunately, that is a time when we saw the Asian currency crisis in Thailand uh, that happened in July 1997. And it, it was followed by the, uh, the Japan's banking crisis in November. 
So unfortunately, uh, there is no clear um, the sort of um, the segregation uh, the, in terms of the response from of the uh, consumers to the consumption tax rate hike and those uh, uh, the cri unexpected the crises. So the, the but uh, the, the biggest problem in 1997 was naturally the financial crisis, but the, um, the unexpected uncertainties ahead of uh, the consumers. And as now the, uh, the response of the government, and the, including the BOJ, was so behind the curve, and uh, so people probably had thought that, um, the, okay, we had to cut the spending and, uh, to, and also raise the savings rate to cope with that. I think that was a typical response of the consumers. So, the, but this time, um, the, naturally, the, we can't tell whether uh, we will have those unexpected shock. So, the, just to cope with those uh, unexpected event, uh, just accident, I would call, and so that it may worth uh, the, um, the government spending uh, some extra money to just um, to cope with uh, those unexpected events. And so that is my rush, the rationale uh, that the government uh, should be allowed to spend some more. And the, um, the, the, your second point, yes, um, is uh, uh, this any mechanism from the, uh, the corporate tax rate cut which should lead to an increase in a corporate profit to an increase in the wage rate or the labor income in general or the capex. Unfortunately, in the long run, yes. And especially from the corporate tax, so the corporate profit increase to the, uh, the labor's income, as I showed you, over the long term, it will be flattened, but it takes time. And also in case of the, from the corporate, um, the, uh, the profit increase to the capex, unfortunately, there is no clear so the ch transmission mechanism. And in my view, that uh, that is because of the lack of the corporate governance in Japan. And basically, the cash held by the, uh, the corporations is basically the shareholders' money, not the, the uh, workers' money. And as I said to you, you know, over the long term, though, uh, the, those monies will eventually go well, uh, given back to the workers. So that if other corporations don't want to use those extra cash for capital spending, the corporations should use those extra money for the uh, share buyback or an increase in the dividends. Then actually the, uh, the shareholders, who are the consumers, they will spend money in some way or other, probably an inc by an increase in the consumption. Th then those money will be circulated in the economies to raise the growth rate. But the Japan's problem is because of the lack of the corporate governance or the role of the shareholders, even the government cannot force the, uh, the corporations to spend money either way. And uh, so in that sense, the, an increase of the, um, the, or the enhancement of the role of the shareholders is a very important part of the structural reform in Japan so that the corporations should use the, all the resources, including the extra resources, more efficiently. Um, think about a situation where you're a corporate executive and if by the pressure from the labor union, you have to raise your wages. Would you do that? That's the point. Yeah, I think that is the point. I think the um, tax cuts could generate, I think, decent amount of money, probably. But in the meantime, if you think that the, if you do not think your labor is improving productivity, and if you do think that you have some excess labor, but cannot fire people, what are you going to do? You're going to raise wages for everybody? I don't think so. If you're, if you're a corporate executive, I would not do that. What I want to do is to cut the number of labor. Uh, maybe you know, I would like to uh, reduce some you know, less productive workers' wages, and then I can probably raise some wages for some good workers. So I think in that sense, as I pointed out in my presentation, Mr. Aso is quite right in that sense. I think the just the government pressure would not work on the you know, wage increases. And I do not think corporate income tax rate cut is really working. But our point is, Japan's, you know, the structural problems, one, number one, labor market rigidity, and number two, remaining low productivity for the services industry. So, m may work for a, a few large listed companies in terms of raising wages, but in our estimate, Large Japanese corporations are in excess of labor, for sure, almost for sure. 
Uh, in our estimate from the BOGS tank and survey, I say manufacturing industry's excess labor is 1.5 million. Roughly speaking, 7%. They don't need 7% of labor. So what they want to do is, okay, we're going to cut 7% of the number of employees, but raise wages by, by 3% for all. That makes sense because they can reduce labor costs by 4%. That would happen. Uh, but I don't think they're keeping the number of employees just raising wages, almost impossible, in my view. Um, and I think they may want to continue to reduce their debt, just you know, the repaying debt. So in that sense, the BOJ monitor supposed to be needed. So we need you know, the companies not continue to repay their debt, but to increase their borrowing. But um, um, you know, the demographics headwinds kind of thing still still there. So um, I'm, I'm fairly doubtful. Uh, on, on that side. You, you can, I think, invite the big corporations, I think the executives here, and asking whether or not you're going to raise wages. One of the, my friends working for the hedge funds came to Japan two weeks ago. He questioned all the corporate executives he, he saw, and his question was, are you raising wages? And almost everybody said no. And he was really disappointed. Please. Yes, is my name. Uh, questions for both speakers. Uh, how do you assess the impact of the holding of some of the Olympic Games, Olympic Games in 22? And uh, will it overcome the minus uh, or negative effect of the VAT hike? Yeah, I think um, the um, number one, I, I tend to think that uh, the um, Olympic Games, I think the uh, positive impact on the economy could be, um, could be substantial. I, I, I would say it could be um, because there uh, are still many uncertainties, but um, the, some, I think, the positive second round effects, such as the not only the Olympic Games stadium construction, but I think there may be some um, the hotel constructions kind of things, maybe infrastructure investment. Uh, that could have the, you know, some multiplier effect on, on GDP. Uh, we don't have any uh, specific number yet, uh, but could be somewhat bigger than Tokyo Metropolitan government estimate of the, uh, like, you know, the three to five trillion yen, if I limit. Three to five, they say? I don't know. But I think they could be bigger. Um, but number two, um, the having said that, um, is it really a um, positive thing for people who live in Tokyo? I don't know. Um, I, I, I think you know, the, some inflation, including property market inflation, would be needed for Japan to improve the fiscal balance. Uh, but I think the, you know, we, we may be facing some strange problem of the rising property prices in Tokyo area only. You know, people living in Tokyo would not necessarily benefit from that because I think the, if the property inflation is stronger than wage increases, I think, you know, was off in that sense. So that is one of the issue. And the other, the other issue is that uh, the, if the you know, Olympic Games do not have any long lasting impact on GDP, and if, if people become too optimistic about the outlook of the economy, uh, I saw the Nikkei Shimbun's, I think, the poll results over the weekend, and I think 70% of Japanese taxpayers say it is positive on growth. Um, okay, it is, it is probably the case, but in the meantime, uh, I think the too much of optimism bit is, is a bit scary um, because I think the, what could happen after Olympic Games is not necessarily that, that positive. So uh, that's kind of the points I'd like to make. But a point is probably positive, uh, but a bit of the uncertainties. Okay. Um, the, the first I share Shirakawa-san's view uh, on the first point that the direct um, the, uh, the impact from the Olympic game to the, uh, the growth rate of Japan uh, is uh, limited. And as a three trillion yen for the, um, the next seven years is almost nothing. 
And but the, I think that we shouldn't um, forget about the role of the sort of the multiplier effect. And it totally depends on what the government will do in the coming years. And the, um, the, actually, the, uh, the, I think now it, the, the Olympic game gives us a great opportunity to, um, to, and, uh, to, uh, to raise the, uh, the growth rate of the uh, Tokyo area through the deregulations. And uh, the, actually, in the past, the government has spent a huge amount of the money on the, um, the infrastructures and other type of the public works. But most of the money are spe was spent on the, in the regions. So the, unfortunately, the most of 